We started 13 weeks ago taking a walk chapter by chapter through Mark's gospel. We're on Mark chapter 13, and so you can figure out the rest of the series uh, for the next few weeks. But I want to encourage you, if you haven't uh, read through Mark, if you haven't been tracking with us for whatever reason, uh, it's never too late to start. The Good News Challenge is about um, not just being good people, it's about being good news people and acting out on our faith. We're saved by grace, through faith, and yet then we're called to follow Jesus, and it's in the doing, it's in the being that we discover we can really make an impact. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the sticker challenge from, from past weeks, but if you're new to the church, this is an amazing season for us because our people have actually been putting stickers up on a map, one of the great moments in the life of the church, and that tells you something about the history of the church. No, I'm just kidding. But join us in that. It's an important, important exercise, I think. This morning, we're going to be reading the tail end of Mark 13. What we've just missed is spectacular. We're not going to read it. We're not even going to talk about it much. But I know now in the next few minutes while I'm talking, you're going to read the first part of Mark 13. And uh, Pastor Shorty Brown is going to be reading uh, Mark 13, 32 to 37 for us. And I just before Shorty steps up there, I want you to uh, memorize this handsome face because... Uh, pastor Shorty is our calling pastor, and so uh, if you know of anyone that uh, needs a visit, he has a visitation team that he supervises, uh, this puts a face with the name, a handsome face, a great name, uh, a great person. Is that enough of a setup for you, Shorty? Are we, are we, we're good to read God's Word. Hey, we stand to read God's Word, and Shorty, if you'll step up, we'll be reading together Mark 13, 32 to 37. Mark 13, 32 to 37. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each to their own assigned task, and tells it the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Shorty. You can have a seat. I'm telling you, we are really, really preoccupied with the end times. Uh, what we didn't read today is amazing. Again, just to tease you into reading that. Next fall, we begin a series, first time we've ever done it at TFRC RC on Revelation. And we will answer all the unanswerable questions in 12 weeks or less. Uh, beginning in September. Don't, please don't hold me to that. Um, but it's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Are we living in the end times or not? Let me ask, let me, I'm going to do a survey here. This is a professional scientific survey. Feel free, you know, no intimidation factor here. How many of you believe we're living in the end times? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Um, George Barna operates a research institute. It's the Christian version of the Gallup poll people. It's bar none the most effective, efficient, highly recognized survey organization and instrument uh, in the United States. The survey that he just brought back to us as churches is that and again, assuming most of us would label, pardon the label, ourselves evangelical, 77% of American evangelicals believe we're living in the end times. And that resonates, doesn't it? Most of the people we talk to, if we're really honest and we don't mind raising our hands, believe that somehow, somewhere, Jesus is coming soon. 
Now, the, the study was done throughout the country with all Protestants, and the, the general Protestant response to the question, are we living in the end times, was 54%. So evangelicals, honestly, a quarter more evangelicals than general Protestants believe it. So people especially like us believe we're living in the end times. Here's what's intriguing about it. I am in the midst of a lot of conversations, end time conversations. I know a lot of you are. A lot of you love to research signs of the times, uh, politics, Middle East, all of that kind of thing. The question I'm going to raise today is, that our, is if our belief and our anticipation translates into action. If we believe there's an urgency, do we behave like it? Or do we behave as if whatever is going to happen whenever? There's some great research that's been done on end times prophecies, and sadly, I got sucked up into the vortex of that in the last couple of weeks. There's a lot of amazing stuff that's been predicted. I'm just going to give you a, a few that may jar your memory a little bit in recent days. And I, I, actually, there's a website that has approximately 250 end times predictions that have taken place over the last two to three centuries. And again, it just took me way too long. But it was, it was really cool. If you're interested, just Google something like end times prophecies and you'll be able to spend the week, your next vacation week, studying. 1981, the first day. Anyone ever remember this guy? Hal Lindsey. Um, Hal Lindsey declared, I, I won't suggest he prophesied because then we'd have to stone him from a biblical perspective. He declared the rapture would occur before December 31st, 1981, based upon biblical prophecy, astronomy, and ecological concerns. 1995, another name you probably recall, the, just the horrific developments. Branch Davidians in 1992 in Waco, Texas, changed the name of their commune from Mount Carmel to Ranch Apocalypse, because of his belief that the final battle of Armageddon would start at their compound. They calculated that the end would occur in 1995, but in 1993, after a 51-day standoff, most of you that are old enough to remember saw the flames and saw the carnage of 76 men, women, and children dying in the compound fire. 2000, let's see if you know this name. I don't know how many of you read the book. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 13 weeks and has sold millions of copies. Uh, Michael Drosnin, actually an avowed atheist or agnostic, I can't recall, found a hidden message in the Pentateuch, the first five books in the Bible, that predicted World War III would involve a worldwide atomic holocaust would begin in 2000. Or, or was it 2006? He wasn't quite sure. Both dates come and gone. Then here's another great date for you, December 22nd, 2012. Did everyone see the movie? Uh, the Mayan calendar has had many divisions of time. It's honestly very complex. They anticipated the end of the world near the winter solstice of 20 and 12. I saw the movie. It's a, it was a great action movie. But you heard the conversations at the water cooler, perhaps. What if? What if? And that was, you know, a year and a half ago. And then the last date I'll give you is October 30th, 2099. <laughs> this is my own personal belief that shortly after the Cubs win the World Series, Jesus returns, but not a day before. You get the point. For 2,000 years, and if you study the history of end times predictive prophecy and end times predictions, Christians have been predict predicting Jesus' return is imminent. And imagine those first Christians, that first generation, that were waiting for the weeks and then the months and then the years, and you know what happens as you wait. Let me take you back to the days of Jesus and look briefly at first century messianic expectations. Just this is the teachable moment the background of this text. From about 200 B.C. on 
to the time of Jesus and a little bit beyond, this anticipation of Messiah, a savior, deliverer, rose rampantly and of course in the face of great oppression from Rome. And when the Messiah would return, so said popular wisdom, it would institute an abundance of blessings. Take a look at this uh, portion. It's not scripture, but it's really a apocryphal work that was written in the mid to late first century, same century Jesus was born. It says, it shall come to pass that the Messiah shall begin to be revealed. The earth also shall yield its fruit 10,000 fold, and on each vine there will be a thousand branches. Each branch shall produce a thousand clusters, each cluster a thousand grapes, and it shall come to pass at that time that the treasury of manna itself shall again descend from on high. When the Messiah came, the popular belief was, there would be an, it would be accompanied by an incredible time of abundance to the land and prosperity to the people. The second major expectation was that when the Messiah would come, he would be a messianic ruler and deliverer. And again, this is from the Psalms of Solomon, not in our Bible, but it's an apocryphal work which was seen almost as significant as Scripture to the people that lived. About first, mid-first century B.C. is when this was written. This is what it says, And he himself will be pure from sin so that he may rule a great people. He will rebuke rulers and remove sinners by the might of his word and relying upon his God throughout his days he will not stumble for God will make him mighty by means of his Holy Spirit. Now, if 77% of evangelicals uh, believe that we live imminently awaiting the return of Jesus, 99% of the Jews in the days of Jesus were looking and they were rabid in their anticipation for the fact that the Messiah could be here, or is he here? And you know how that is when you're waiting for someone to come, the visitor, someone to visit you, or Santa Claus, or whatever the case may be. When you're anticipating the arrival, you live differently. You anticipate with intensity. And I want you to understand that was the cultural ethos of Jesus' day. There was a multiple set of expectations of what the Messiah might have been. And we'll just quickly scroll through those, although they're fascinating, each one of them. Just varied expectations of who Jesus, of who, who the Messiah would be. First, and probably the majority opinion, is he would be a political deliverer and ruler like King David. It was certainly the majority opinion. Secondly, another expectation is that originated in Qumran. Some of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the literature that came out of that. In the literature that comes out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes there were anticipating a priestly king, someone that would reinstitute the priesthood the way it was designed to be. Not the corrupt priesthood of Jesus' day, but the original type of priesthood, holy and righteous. Then there was a third group of people called the Zealots. We talk about them from time to time. They were rabid in their quest to overthrow Rome and to restore the righteousness of the law to Israel. They were looking for a militaristic, mighty warrior type of Messiah. Fourth, from the different passages in Isaiah, the prophet talked about a suffering servant and many anticipated someone who would come perhaps political, perhaps king, but would still suffer at the hands of someone. And then fifth, and this is the last one for the discussion today, there was something called the Son of Man. Very obscure in the Old Testament. There's a, simply a verse in, Deut- in uh, Daniel 7, 13. Uh, really, it's Daniel, not Deuteronomy 7, 13. And the Son of Man, and and just listen carefully, was a pre-existing, transcendent God-man who would come from above. But that expectation really didn't develop, really didn't expand until after the Old Testament was written. Although it was based on one verse, one or two verses in the Old Testament. Now it's fascinating that Jesus, when he arrives on the planet, works to avoid the expectations of the culture based upon really all the first four in particular of those expectations. And the question is, what would it have taken for, for the Jewish nation to believe that Jesus was the Messiah? World peace, political harmony, elimination of Roman opposition, uh, taking the role of king. 
And Jesus crossed the wires, folks, of those first century expectations and assumed the role primarily. In fact, this is the, the term he uses most often for himself was uh, one, two, three, four, five. Which one? Son of man. And it's not even a, a well-developed biblical concept. That's intriguing to me. But it tells me something that relates to what Shorty just read to us, that you're never going to know when. And I would suggest, based upon how he brought his messiahship to earth, we may not even know how, to a degree. It's an interesting thought. There was virtually no expectation whatsoever for a Messiah that would be killed. So, you understand the context of what Jesus is teaching in Mark 13. There's this rabid expectation, and they're all over the charts. Um, we're in March Madness, NCAA basketball, and everyone predicts, not everyone, you may not like the sport, but a lot of us predict who the national champion will be. And there's a lot of disappointment. Millions of dollars nationwide are being lost as we speak. Uh, who knows? But the joy's in the journey, right? It's in the brackets. Imagine a nation anticipating a Messiah. Arguably, uh, Israel had the greatest expectation of a future deliverer than any other nation in all of time and all of history, so say the scholars. You get the point. You get the point. Jesus says, just before it's going to happen, there's really four things. And this is the first 31 verses of chapter 13. I want to give you these briefly. First of all, one of the signs that God's judgment is imminent is there'll be religious cultism, false prophets who claim authority and power in Jesus' name. Secondly, there's going to be social upheaval. Wars, famine. Third, there's natural disasters, earthquakes. Fourth, there's going to be persecution. All four of those categories are going to be taking place. And then this happens. And this we double back into Mark 13. Look at these two verses. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And all God's people said in the first century, Amen. Come quickly, Jesus. And then Jesus says in Mark 13, 30, Truly I tell you, truly is always added for emphasis in that language. Again, look at this. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The religious cultism took place, the social upheaval took place, the natural disasters took place, and the persecution took place. All before that generation, specific generation, passed away. With that one exception that the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That's where scholars then have had difficulty for 2,000 years unpacking this chapter. Because it seems that everything was fulfilled, Jesus says, in that first generation. But another interpretation of the chapter is that Jesus is telescoping all of the future history, and meaning generation upon generation upon generation of these kinds of things will happen until that final climactic event when the Son of Man returns in clouds with great power and glory. This is why we're confused. Because is Jesus telescoping the rest of history or speaking to a specific generation? Ah, you may say, that's the dilemma. And wherever you land, you will land on a scholarly position. Uh, you're right or right depending on which position you take. It's confusing. And I ask myself, Jesus, couldn't you have clarified a little bit the rest of the story about a Mark chapter 17, 18, and 19 to put it all in a box, neatly, neatly wrapped it for us, so we know exactly what's going to happen. Because what's problematic is where Jesus goes next with this 
chapter. He says in verse 32, which is the first verse we read today, but about that day, and I would argue this may be the key verse, out of all of Mark 13, the 37 verses, this could be the key verse. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In spite of that, we've been trying to calculate it for 2,000 years. Do you find that ironic? If there's one word I want to leave you with today, it's the magic word of Mark 13. The word is this. Watch. Let's see, that's four exclamation points. Is that enough? It's mentioned four times in different ways in chapter 13. Verse 33 gives us these words. Be on guard, exclamation point. Be alert, exclamation point. You do not know when that time will come. And, and it, is, it is the attitude that motivates action of followers of Jesus from that moment to this one is that we're going to watch. We're going to talk about the word in, in just a few minutes. But I was, I, I was at a pastor's retreat this past week and uh, Mike Smith and I were hiking one day and uh, I came across this sign. I've seen a lot of signs walking, but I thought you might enjoy this one. Be on guard. Be alert. I dared Mike to try the experiment, and he wasn't up to the challenge. But it is the message of Jesus as we look to the future is don't fall asleep. Now, it's an interesting word, this word watch, and this is your brief Greek lesson for the day. The, the Greek word is this, agropneo. Let's say it together, agropneo, very good. And the word means to be vigilant, to be deliberate, to be careful. There's a careful awareness. Um, now, it's interesting, again, just the sidelight. Do you know that when you read watch in English, there are eight different Greek words for that word, one word, watch, in translation? Again, not that I'm, I'm criticizing English as a language, but the reality is it, sometimes Scripture just doesn't translate well. And so when I use that word watch, when Jesus used the word watch, that's what he's talking about. There's a whole spectrum of watch words, from guarding a prisoner to simply observing someone or something, to measuring time to diligent faithfulness. It's only used a few times, and it's in some ways the apex of the watch pyramid. Watch, be alert, be on guard. And it just reminds us that there's probably, and you can argue the point, email me tomorrow. Just don't talk to me today. But arguably, there's really three ways, three choices in how we face the future. General categories. Again, work with me a little bit. One way that we look to the future is apathetically. Now, I'm speaking as Christians. I'm speaking as non-Christians. I, I was reading a, an article uh, dated a couple of years ago from uh, December 2011 in USA Today. It analyzed an interesting surge in a group of Americans called the spiritually apathetic. They aren't atheists. Instead, according to the article, they simply shrug off God, shrug off religion, heaven, or the ever-trendy search for meaning and purpose kind of stuff. Their attitude could be summed up as, so what? I mean, we probably know folks like that. I mean, we, some of us may be there. And again, I want to just give you one more set of quick statistics. The article pointed to the following statistics from a variety of surveys. Take a look at this first one. 44% of people within this one survey said that they spend no time seeking eternal wisdom. 44%. This is not just Christians, this is culture-wide. They don't care. No big deal. From another survey, 46% said they never wonder if they'll go to heaven. Don't care. That's our issue here, right? In four-walled buildings, they don't care. 28% said, it's not a major priority in my life to find deeper purpose. So if you're bumping up against apathy in the world, and I mean, humbly submitted, it may even have crept inside the walls of the church a little, 
That's the, explaining why. It's a new cultural wave. See, our culture isn't simply becoming anti-Christian. We're becoming spiritually apathetic, which is sad, isn't it? When we talk about good news, good news, good news, and nobody cares, something's wrong. Maybe with us. See, spiritually isn't a turnoff, it's a growing sense of whatever. And, and even within the body of Christ, I would argue humbly that spiritual apathy breeds spiritual inactivity. We become people, we become people of the opinion, not people of action. Quick to share opinions on any subject, political, end times, you name it. But now putting faith into action, there's just this gap. You know, I, this brought to mind a classic scene out of Seinfeld. I confess to watching Seinfeld back in the day. But if you ever watch that movie, just a hilarious uh, TV sitcom, rather, there's a boyfriend of Elaine called Patty, or Putty, David Putty. And one exchange, in one episode, Elaine asks him, do you believe in God? And again, Putty is this professing Christian. He's kind of the caricature of Christianity, unfortunately, on this show. Elaine asks, do you believe in God? And yes, Putty replies. Elaine asks, is it a problem that I'm not religious? Putty says, not for me. And how's that, she asks. And her boyfriend responds by saying, I'm not the one going to hell. (laughs) I love that exchange because I think, humbly submitted, in some ways it defines Christianity. I got mine. I'm not sure I care if you get yours. We've got ours. Whatever. You get the point. That even within the body of Christ, there there dwells this low-level, symptomatic apathy. Uh, You see, we would rather sit and discuss the end times than act on the urgency of our belief in the end times. See, we are good people. You are good people. I'm a good person. The question is, are we the good news people? Do we act out our faith or have we simply become this accumulation of beliefs and opinions so quick to share, so quick to judge? Apathy. There's a second uh, perspective on looking to the future, and that's being paranoid. Um, I'm going to call it apocalyptic anxiety syndrome. We expect things to be horrific, horrendous. We're watching for signs, world leaders, specifics in the Middle East, classic case of paralysis by analysis, and we're permanently ducking, and not for worship, we're just ducking. I was in Thailand a, a month ago now, and uh, in, in the hotel bathrooms, you have to step down a couple of inches into the bathrooms, and you have to be aware of that. The other thing they do, and this is incredibly discriminatory, the, the top of the door frame is about six feet tall. I have no idea why. But so as you walk into these bathrooms in the hotels, you're looking down, and routinely in the first week, I go doink. And I had like moguls on my head after the first, I'm not kidding, three times in the first four days. And I'm walking very carefully, there it is. And bam, I just hit my, because by week two, I didn't do it anymore. But I kept ducking and ignoring the reality of what was literally at eye level. There's a lot of Christians who are apathetic about the end times. There's also a few, humbly submitted, that have developed this duck and run syndrome, concerns so much about the future that they've lost the joy of their faith. There's there's no hope. Um, It makes all the difference in what we anticipate. But Jesus never says, hey, be be real afraid, be afraid, be very afraid, be paranoid. No, that's not the point. The third way to look to the future that I'm going to suggest, we'll call it optimistic urgency. Um, Some people have the idea we don't know when Jesus is coming, so it doesn't really matter. Others have the idea we don't know when Jesus is coming, so we have to find out and set a date. The right response according to the passage and according to Jesus, I don't know when Jesus is coming, so I have to be alert, eager, and ready for his coming. I have to get busy. I have to be a good news person. 
And the gospel of Mark is written as the urgent gospel. The message of Jesus is good news. That's why the good news challenge. It's time we do something this week as a consequence of our faith. If we're on watch, if we're alert, it's not like we're sitting in a huddle singing kumbaya or we've got to get busy. Even when we no longer, longer hand out stickers to put on a map, my prayer is that this group of people will do something, something in the name of Jesus. Hey, then again, if it takes getting a sticker to make you do something, I'm all into that. We've got extra stickers. Let me know. Look at this passage from Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the lean in to the future for a follower of Jesus. Take a good look. Because optimistic urgency describes the lifestyle of followers of Jesus. Hope is that dangerous attitude that has always defined us beginning 2,000 years ago. Hope is what motivated their willingness to risk their lives in the face of persecution. To this day, there are Christians just like us in countries that don't have freedoms that are willing to risk their lives for the hope that they have in Christ. Even going to their deaths. Hope is the motivation to share the good news. Hope is the motivation to live out the good news. An optimistic urgency by its very nature will always, always, always translate into action. Christianity at its core is not simply a belief system, but a belief system that inspires a radical response and revolutionary activity. Read about the history of the church. I think it's really fascinating that in virtually every mission venture we support, hope is right at the core. You go to Thailand, and they just don't just talk but a belief system that offers hope. They offer food. They offer education. They offer family to, to kids of all ages. You go to Malawi, you see the same things. It's the Macaulay's home of future and what? Hope. And it's not simply an attitude of belief. It's food. It's care, it's love, it's community, it's education, it's water. That's what hope looks like to people in need. Whether it's the halfway houses here, Malawi or Thailand, anything else we do, hope translates somehow into action. Optimistic urgency. And simple good news, simple good news is acting on our hope. And actually, this next week, we have a real simple good news challenge. We know the tithing challenge for a lot of you probably is the bar raiser. And again, I just want to encourage you. It's a big deal to discover who we can be and the impact we can make as a community if we really, truly give. But this next week is probably the simplest you have to do. And it will remind you about being a good news person. Here's the good news challenge for the week. Now, I'm going to be optimistic. But reality is, I'm not sure some of you are going to make it out of the octagon. <laughs> and I say that lovingly, of course. This is a simple challenge, isn't it? Right. Right. Peter tells us, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Do it gently and respectfully, but see, good news people bring good news. And I understand the reality of terminal illness, and I understand all of the issues of life, but if anyone, anywhere, is ever going to bring optimistic urgency, you're looking at them. And I want to challenge you this week, to be the one person in the circle that doesn't do 
spiral downward. What do you want to talk? Politics, econ economics, Russia. I dare you this week to practice optimistic urgency. Not just to believe it, but to do it. And in so doing, you never know when the Holy Spirit opens a window where you can explain why you are who you are and why you said what you said. 